And now I want to introduce our presenters. Vivian Mork is, has a master's degree in cross-cultural studies with an emphasis in indigenous knowledge systems. She's a traditional food specialist, a Tlingit language teacher, a gifted writer, an artist, a carver, and a storyteller. Vivian has been passionately teaching and sharing for more than 20 years. She also was one of four Alaskans awarded the Alaska Literary Award for Poetry from the Alaska Arts and Culture Foundation in partnership with the Alaska State Council on the Arts. Vivian co-hosts the Facebook page and blog Planet Alaska with her mother, Viv Vivian Faith Prescott, who is also a poet and writer. And then Josh Smith is a lifelong plant enthusiast who grew up in the Fairbanks area. After graduating high school, he enlisted in the Air Force, which brought him to the Anchorage area. He separated from the service after 10 years and has since settled in Chugiak on a small hobby farm. From there, he channeled his love of plants into starting a small nursery, focusing on native edible plants and hardy fruits. His passion for plants and tackling food security are at the core of his actions. He hopes to share that love and knowledge to facilitate community engagement and change. So, Vivian Mork and Josh. It's nice to see people in the room that I know and love. Thank you for coming. Uh, and as you know, um, I'm super opinionated and really shy. So, <laughs> sorry for the pause. Um, Kachana Kutiti, Kunakawadach, Yaida Junok, Yeti, Big Island, Hawaii, Tsu, Ka Guashe, Heinz 57, Dach, Chinese, Hawaiian, Sami, Ka Irish, all those things. Guash, um, yeah. Um, and that translates to hello, Ninsligan, that's it. I've been telling that dry joke for about 25 years. Anyway. Uh, please forgive me if I say or do anything that offends you today. In the Tlingit language, my name is Yeshk, or cute little raven in English. My name is Vivian Mork, and I'm from the Raven Moiety. I am Tukdain Tan from the Snail House. I am a child of the Tequedi or the Brown Bear, and I'm a grandchild of the Kogwan Tan or the Wolf People. And I was born and raised in Wrangell, but my Kawu and lineage come in from Glacier Bay, and I reside between, at the moment, um, Juneau and the Big Island in Hawaii, and I come from a very large multicultural family. So I am also uh, Chinese, Hawaiian, Sami, Irish, and I am pretty sure a skeleton will come out of the closet at some point in time and I'll get to embrace another cultural food in the world. Um, uh, and thank you for the, the generous, hello, Jacqueline. Uh, oh, where'd she go? Um, she, uh, that was really nice uh, to say all those things. Um, for the most part, uh, as a traditional foods and medicine educator, I just, I love food. Uh, I think it's one of our best um, tools of cross-cultural communication, and I'm passionate about food sustainability. And uh, I think a lot of people are growing and growing and growing their ideas of food sustainability. And I want to now introduce you to Josh, even though she also read a lovely bio from him. Uh, uh, it's, uh, we're both very very, very, very passionate people about our uh, local foods and making sure that we get to survive here sustainably for thousands of more years. So uh, here's my friend Josh. Thank you, Vivian. Honestly, it's such a pleasure to be right now. I first, uh, being a visitor on Clinkett land, it's such an honor. Having Vivian as a teacher, learning about the landscape, learning about the plants here, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And seeing red huckleberries in the wild, that's been a lifelong dream. I, I was picking myself silly yesterday, but <laughs> thrilled beyond seeing wild thimbleberries, oh my gosh. But um, 
I've always been a giant plant nerd, and so it's thrilling to, I started trying to play around, because anybody who goes to nurseries, especially up north, you're trying to find plants that will grow within your garden, and people are like, oh, blueberries and things like that. Most people up here know that domestic blueberries don't do great, and then you run the risk of, we, there's a lot of problems with invasive species, and people are bringing in species, you don't know how they're gonna respond to our local ecology. And so you try to grow these species, they don't thrive or they become a problem. Well, how do you alleviate that potential of failing or planting a problem? you plant our beautiful native species, but nobody was doing that work. So there was a lot of, I started picking berries and started experimenting with them, and we've cracked the code on most of the native berry species, and I think the ultimate goal is for everybody to take this information, hopefully try it at home. So with that, I'll turn it back to Vivian, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so he has a food forest oh, yeah. uh, up in uh, Chugiak, yes. and it is a growing food forest as it goes, and just, was it last week when Rural Cap came? Yes. Uh, so Rural Cap came and they did a whole tour of his food forest, and it's just amazing to see him growing all of our thimbleberries and blueberries and nagoon berries and cloudberries or salmon berries, depending on what region of Alaska you're from. <laughs> We're not here to start a war. Um, we are here to make everybody win. We get to grow all the berries and we all get to benefit from these things. And we feel very passionate about being able to uh, use our local plants for lots of things. Our foods are here to heal our bodies, to heal our mental health, to heal our multi-generational trauma. They are here, we can use them to fight back invasive species. We can use them to help with soil erosion. Uh, we can use them to beautify our spaces. Instead of bringing in invasive species, we can use them for our local landscaping. We can purposely plant our berries next to elders' facilities who can no longer get out out to pick berries and now they can just walk out the front yard of the Pioneer Home maybe one day and pick all of their berries that they love that reminds them of their own grandparents as they age. There's so many reasons to be able to grow our local berries and also how hard is it to find Nagoon berries? <laughs> How hard is it to find cloud berries? But what if we can show you how we actually have been doing permaculture here for thousands of years? When I was going to college and taking our anthropology classes, we learned that the best way to find where an old village is is Where's the best food? Where's the best berries growing? We planted those things on purpose. We were just passionately geeking out last night talking about these, the study that was done on a Haida village where they found out those people were growing the best crab apples in the neighborhood because they were purposely finding them and bringing them along to every single village that they went to. And in that area, it's one of the easiest ways to find an old village site. Look for the best crab apples in the neighborhood and the odds are you're then going to find culturally modified trees, shell midden deposits, all the other foods that we eat. If you go to Yakutat, you're going to find miles of strawberries. That wasn't done just randomly. We made that happen. When you go to Ak Bay, you're going to find this the most beautiful set of thimbleberry bushes you can find in all of Juneau that was done purposely. And so how do we do that purposely today? How do we grow all of our own foods? And I'm passionate not just about our salmon and our deer and our moose. And I'm even more, so our berries are really important too and our vegetables. We can't have just one food. We need all of these things. Diversity is kind of the answer to everything, both uh, biologically, geologically, linguistically, politically. Uh, we need biodiversity and our vegetables, our fruits, our oils, our meats, they are all equally important to each other. And how have we been propagating these things for thousands of years? And it actually isn't always that easy to do some of it, and then some of it is way easier than we ever thought. And uh, I'm a big fan of throwing wet noodles at the wall, see what sticks, and then let's just go with it. And, uh, and Josh has helped a bit with throwing the wet noodles at the wall to see what sticks. And there's so many different ways to be able to teach these things. And uh, for me, when we're uh, teaching, uh, an exceptionally large amount of people want to be able to learn these things in a weekend. How do you learn 10,000 years of surviving off the land in a weekend, in a month, in one year? 
It takes an exceptionally long period of time to do these things. And as you know, we go out and have a great time harvesting for hours, and then we get to go home and process for days. And so there's a lot of levels in all of these things. And so what I like to do is try to find the tips and tricks that make all of these things easier. And uh, some of the, that knowledge you can find in books on these things, and then some of it you really need to get to know the people and the people that are here, and how do we do things, because what you do in Sitka may be different than what you do in Huno, which may be different than what you do in Wrangell. And just because something grows in one place doesn't mean that it should grow in another place. Uh, you will affect that island. So uh, anyway, uh, very passionate about these things. But I think when you're looking at traditional foods, an exceptionally large amount of Alaskans have their favorite berries. For me, the one in front of me is my favorite. When the blueberries are there, blueberries are my favorite. When thimbleberries are there, they are my favorite. And yesterday, red huckleberries and black huckleberries were our favorite forever. It was really great. And um, so when you're looking at, uh, I think hands-on is one of the best ways to learn our traditional foods and medicines and from each other because many of us are knowledgeable and none of us has to be knowledgeable in everything. When you bring our tribe of people together, you get someone who goes, oh, I remember that. My auntie used to make it this way. And then they get to eat that, and then they get to remember, and then they get to rewire that memory. And then that little bit of healing happens, and it can happen with one bite. It's amazing. Anyway, I digress. OK, so um, when you're looking at berries, everyone's got their favorites. And uh, I would like, pe I don't know how to do this because there's so many people in the room. Um, what's your favorite berry? Yesterday was red huckleberries. How about you, chocolate? What, Nagoon berry? How about you? Uh, how about you in the back? What's your favorite berry? Salmon berries. Uh, Darlene, what's your favorite berries? All of them, yay, all right. So all of us usually have a favorite berry and I love it when it's all of our berries. Um, so what we have here is a small selection of berries because all the berries are gonna grow a little bit different. You, uh, It's important to take a look at seeds and uh, how they grow. So we have a selection here of uh, thimble berries, uh, strawberries, nagoon berries, our gooseberries and black currants and our shah, our gray currants, and we have a little bit of black huckleberries, red huckleberries. I think that's a pretty good selection. Oh, and akpiks. We don't call them akpiks here, they're neh, but uh, that's okay. We can fight. Salmonberry, cloudberry, salmonberry, cloudberry. We all win. Okay. Um, sorry, I apologize. You know, we did not bring. Salmon berries here to Sitka for uh, clean kit salmon berries because guess who grows the best salmon berries? Sitka does. They are amazing. This is the land of salmon berries for sure, and red and black huckleberries too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Sitka has the biggest salmon berries of any island. So, anyway, um, which ones would you like to start with, do you I, think? I was actually going to ask um, out of the assortment of berries that Vivian just talked about, which one do you guys think is the easiest to grow? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, out of all the berries, if anybody wanted to take a guess, what do you think is the easiest one to grow? That any, what was it? That's up there. I would say that's number two. Actually, that's the hardest. <laughs> I haven't cracked the code 100%. Uh, actually, I'd put that, that's probably a tie with the salmon berries. It's actually the thimble berries. So, um, so I started the journey about three years ago of trying to cultivate our native berries. And unfortunately, looking at literature, literature is almost non-existent when it comes to growing these. Yeah, all the species that grow in the lower 48 are Canada. Yes, people have done that work. People haven't really done that work here in Alaska. So I had to try to do, I had to do some guesses. And so the thimble, so, okay, before I get to the thimble berries and how easy they are, the first one I was trying to crack was Ukpik or the Rubus cham amaris, um, this being the science-y name, um, so the cloudberries. And this was a species that, again, grows throughout the entirety of Alaska. It's extremely culturally important, especially up in northern Alaska, where it's the bulk of the berries that are picked. But literature is non-existent when it comes to germinating. They basically said that it has such a hard outer seed coat called an endocarp that it just, it on its own, will take 18 to 24 months to germinate and then another seven years to produce berries. So nobody grows them from seed. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. So I started guessing, I'm like, okay, well, I'm picking this uck pick 
right now in a bog in East Anchorage. What would happen if it rotted on the plant? Oh, it would fall in the bog. It would sit there, uh, whatever the, the temperature is above freezing in Anchorage from July until October before it froze. Okay, so that translates in sciencey terms to warm stratification. So, um, so basically, I was like, okay, either something's gonna eat it or it's gonna fall. So I need to replicate that. So that hard seed coat is what keeps it from germinating. Uh, usually an animal would eat it or it'd sit and would ferment. So I'm gonna replicate that by leaving the berries in a bag of their own juice and they're gonna ferment for a couple weeks. And I left them for two to four weeks and it started getting bubbly and gross. I'm like, well, that kind of, it wouldn't be pretty out in nature either. And so then I was like, okay, well, something would probably eat them or something would basically nick that seed coat. So that's where I brought the blender in and I blended the seeds up to remove move the pulp and clean the seeds. And I was like, okay, well, after this, something ate it, deposited it, it would sit out there in the bog for another couple months before it froze. So that's like, okay, warm stratification. I mix the seeds in with moist media, which I forgot. Um, <laughs> and uh, it would sit there for a couple months above freezing and whatever biological activity is going in the soil, it'll help break down that seed coat and help the water get to the embryo. Well, any boreal species of berries, if they germinate in the fall, they die. So what they have to undergo is a process called cold stratification. Basically, there's a hormone inside the embryo that keeps it from germinating. And these plants have lived here since the beginning. So they know that if they germinate in the fall, they're not gonna survive. And they do that because there's a hormone in the embryo that keeps them from germinating after they're fresh. So they have to undergo a cold period or a winter in order for the seeds to feel warm and fuzzy to germinate. Because temperatures between 33 and 40 degrees, but moist conditions, what that does is it slowly, it starts the biological clock where that hormone slowly starts diminishing inside the embryo. And when that happens, basically each seed has a different requirement. Turns out thimbleberries, they have no requirement. They germinate fresh uh, versus your uck pick. They need probably 90 days of cold stratification to feel warm and fuzzy about germinating. And sometimes if they don't uh, accomplish that in one season, they'll go dormant an additional year and germinate that following spring because they need to add that clock needs to be met. It, if they only hit 60 days their first winter and then it warms up, they haven't met that requirement. The seed is it has all the time in the world. It could just sit there dormant in the, the soil column until the following year and then it germinates when it's ready. So how do you basically simulate what's going on in nature? Because all these grow on their own, clearly out in the wild. How do you simulate that in an artificial condition indoors? Well, I then, once I did the warm stratification for the uck pick, I brought them indoors, put them in the crisper drawer of the fridge and let them sit there for about 90 days. And at this point, I'm guessing, I'm just throwing the wet noodles because I have no idea what's gonna work so literature doesn't exist. I did that and I started seeing the first seeds crack open, the first little radicals pop out. I'm like, uh, it was probably 15 or 20 the Germany that first go around, but that was a code that had been cracked that nobody else had done. And so I'm like, okay, well, these germinated, maybe it's kind of like what we talked about. Maybe some of the seeds, their clock hasn't run up yet. They still need a little more cold. So I took the baggie of seeds and peat moss. I removed the ones that were germinating, put the rest in the fridge for another two to three weeks, pulled it back out. There was another 10% of them that germinated. I did that repeatedly in the site. And not only were they reaching their, uh, their amount of time that they needed, but some of them require that oscillating temperature between warm and cold for them to be like, okay, hey, uh, this feels like spring in Alaska. And so by spring, it was almost 90% germination of the uck pick. And by that following, uh, I started sharing the information online. We've had researchers from the Department of Agriculture in Canada reach out to us about our instructions so they could help save relic populations of this species down in the Eastern Maritime of Canada. So when, uh, once I figured that out with Uck Pick, I'm like, that's probably the hardest one. Uh, and then I discovered red huckleberries. But, <laughs> um, so once we cracked that code, I started applying that to all the berries. And sometimes it worked. Uh, come to find out blueberries, they didn't need that warm period. All they need is that cold stratification. They germinate after 90 days. Uh, our bog blueberries, like people think, oh, our blueberries are gonna grow really slowly. You do them under grow lights, they'll grow, they grow like little weeds. Like the bog blueberries, from the time they germinate to the, their one month birthday, they're already three inches tall. And then so, like the native early blueberries, the Alaska blueberries, the huckleberries, they're much slower. It takes a couple months to reach that point, but we're figuring that as we go. Well, thimbleberries, I was like, okay, hey, they're a ruba species, they're a raspberry, they probably have a hard seed coat because they're meant to be eaten by a bear or bird and be distributed. So they probably have all the same requirements as the uck pick. So I got seeds from Hanes. I started that stratification process. I, I, I fermented them, put them, uh, blended them up, cleaned the seeds, put them in uh, moist peat moss, put them on the counter for warm stratification. And lo and behold, a week and a half later, they were germinating. I'm like, wow, it's October. This is the wrong time for thimbleberries to be germinating. But that was a lesson learned. It turns out about 10 to 20% of the thimbleberry seeds don't have that cold requirement, or maybe it's met just by that couple weeks of fermentation in the fridge. So thimbleberries, the ones that didn't germinate, I put them back in the fridge for 90 days. And at the end of that 90 days, it was almost 100% germination. Like literally the whole, seed, the whole bag inflated with seedlings. 
So what that translates to is could we take them, actually Vivian, what do you think? Do you think we could just take thimbleberry seeds and go plant them and they'll germinate in the spring? <laughs> yes, and uh, but uh, here's what I want to say about part of what he discovered and with that growth of those things. So there's things that grow from seed and yep. seed only. And there are things that, of course, also grow from rhizomes, right? And for clinking people, I just got to add this in to com uh, complement that. So um, some of my favorite vegetables in the springtime are the new shoots of thimbleberry shoots and the new shoots of salmonberry shoots. And those are some that I've been feeding elders for a, an exceptionally long time that when they eat them, it reminds them of their childhood. When they were going out in the springtime and picking those shoots with their friends and eating those. And so when something grows that quickly, uh, it becomes a food source that we could propagate and feed people a lot more. And then, of course, if you, if you overpick, we need our salmon berries. We can't pick them all, right? And so there is a, a way that we can manage all of these in a way that we can be eating our vegetables and our fruits from the same thing. So. Absolutely. So I, I talked about the process of stratification, how I got things to germinate. I oh, tell them the salmon berry story. Uh, of the, oh, where I, oh, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, <laughs> what's funny is, so salmon berries, I, the first time I did them, I applied the same process I did with the pick. I did the warm stratification, cold stratification. They took an additional month, but then they started germinating. And by the May, I got about 40% germination. When you pick salmon berries, that's thousands of seeds. So I had thousands of seedlings, even at 40%. I was really excited. That next year, I'm like, yeah, I cracked the code on salmon berries. I did the next year, I got 14 to germinate total. I'm like, wow, okay, I didn't hit the mark like I thought I did. <laughs> and then I did it the third year and I got two to germinate I'm out of thousands. I'm like, okay, but what was funny is at the end of the season, I had this bag of salmonberry seeds that didn't germinate. I'm like, wow, this is worthless to me. So I took the bag of salmonberry seeds, dumped them in a garden bed and forgot about them because I don't label anything, it's my toxic trait. And I dumped a pile of seeds there and I planted all around it, planted stuff. And then the next spring, there was just this eruption of random seedlings. I'm like, what are these? There was like, I was like, this is a weird, uh, strain of chickweed or something, just thousand seedlings in a map, but it was such a dense map, but such a small area. I'm like, this is deliberate. Dang it, Josh, this is why you label things. So I literally sat there, I was staring at it. I'm like, okay, well, I have to key this out. It, the, at the Cody lead on stage, they all look the same. You can't tell when that first leaf comes out of the seed, like, yeah, this tells me nothing. This isn't helpful at all. So then I was like, I had to let them grow. I started seeing the leaves come out. I'm like, Oh my gosh. And then I started looking at the little seeds that are coming off. I'm like, those are salmon berries. I just germinated thousands of salmon berries. <laughs> and so what came, what was interesting about that is these species, again, they're perfectly adapted for our climate to grow in our climate, in our environment. And while I'm trying to simulate this indoors, uh, some of these species still just do better outdoors. So with the salmon berries, I did two experiments this year, and I'll have to report back to you as to which one was more successful. I'm going through my normal, uh, normal process of bringing them indoors, see if I can crack that coat a little bit more, maybe some warm, more warm stratification, more cold stratification. But I also took a fresh bag of fermented berries from Whittier and dumped them in a garden bed. I'm gonna see if they germinate better outdoors, because if they do it better outdoors, why am I bringing it indoors? I would rather focus that space on energy and space for blueberries, because blueberries are slow growing, and you can kind of get more growth out of a blueberry plant under grow lights than you can under natural conditions. So when it comes to thimbleberries, I, I th would be inclined to just take berries and throw them. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And I really love that version of gardening myself. Um, that's, that's my toxic trait. Um, so uh, what time are we at? Should we start Absolutely. with it and the demonstration? Yes. And uh, which one would you like to start with? I, I'm partial to my Ukpik. OK, uh, let's do it. I, okay. so, because we, here in Sitka, so Ukpiks, uh, cloudberries, uh, they're hard to find here in Sitka. I'm not telling you where my spots are. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Um, so, no, oh, go ahead. Oh, no. Sorry. Absolutely. Uh, let me actually set this up for you. That is perfect. If, Thank and you. Then you can have both your hands. And everyone needs to I appreciate it. Uh, you're taller. <laughs> <laughs> is that okay? That's perfect. Okay. So, 
Uh, even in the Anchorage area, Uppick or Rubus Chamemorus is occasional. It only grows in very specific bogs. I, I was fortunate enough to explore a little bit of muskeg bog yesterday, and I found the species growing there. I was really excited about it. I was actually looking for the crab apples, but nonetheless. Um, but in Anchorage, it's very specific the environments you find. It's little peat bogs where the transition zone between where it's too wet for spruce trees and the full spruce forest. Because they need that interface where it's too wet for them to be outcompeted by taller vegetation, but, and they, but they need the sun. So you, you only grow in that interface up in Anchorage. So we have a couple patches that I also won't tell anybody about in the Anchorage area. But um, these berries are locally abundant in those locations and only those locations. But when you go up north, up uh, on the North Slope or Western Alaska, where they call them salmon berries or uck pick, um, these species are one of the dominant berry species that people pick. So it's, I felt it was really important to figure out how to grow these. So these are easy to see because they have really big seeds. So you ask yourself, OK, these berries have been sitting in a mashy pulp because we, OK, they're probably eaten by an animal. They're going to be scarified by the gastric acids of whatever animal eats them and then deposited. So how do we replicate that? And we have to undergo a process called scarification, or at least in sciencey terms. So this has a really hard seed coat that so the seed can survive the passing through a bear and sit there dormant and germinate when it's ready. So we have to kind of override that or we have to simulate what it would undergo in nature. So with me, these berries have been fermenting in their own juice. They're acidic, so the acid is acting. Mind you, not as strong as what an animal would be, but it's fermenting in its own juices right now, which is helping soften that seed coat. Well, now we're gonna go with mechanical scarification, which is a blender, which also is uh, effective because this pulp right here, it's if we uh, process this and keep it in peat moss inside the house or on the counter, you're running the risk of these sugars feeding molds and fungi and things like that, and while out in nature, the soil is an entire ecosystem, so you have things that are going to eat those fungi, so you don't have to worry about it. Indoors, you don't have those checks and balances, so you have to make sure you're uh, planting clean seed. So without me gabbing all day, so we have a fancy little Bluetooth blender. I, I'm actually amazed by that technology. So um, the real trick with this is we're using the blender method. Um, use one part berries to four to five parts water. Because if you add any more berries, you're making a smoothie. The whole idea of this is the seeds that are, compa or that are viable, that have fully developed, the seeds are going to sink in the water column and the full pulp is going to float. And it allows you to basically separate the two with water in this middle. So with this, I'm going to try not to make a mess. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Um, Yeah. Can we take the ones that we don't like to eat because they're bitten up or yucky or whatever and use those for growing? That is actually my preferred way to do it. Because when there's a beautiful ripe uck pick, I'm eating that one. But when, <laughs> but the, when there's one that actually my second batch of cloudberries that I got, they were I'd missed the prime time season by about a week, and they were all kind of that grayish, like sickly color. So pickers weren't going to come get them because they're not like they're not fresh. But for my purposes, that's ideal because they've already started the fermentation process in the field. So I'm going to go with less because I this is a small blender. I've never used it before. So I added a little bit of berries. So you notice the fermented pulp and the juices and the seeds are all mixed together. Well, now I have some fresh water and I'm going to spill this everywhere. I apologize. Okay. So yay, I made a fermented berry smoothie. So now that process basically, we have this. Usually I'll do this in a much larger blender. Um, if you have a Vitamix, you probably want to be careful with that because you could turn your seeds into a smoothie as well. Luckily, the, the uck pick seeds are pretty, pretty hard. So with a couple of pulses, they won't be hurt. But now I have this. Oh, okay. I'm just gonna do a couple pulses because I don't want to make a smoothie. Okay, so I'm gonna let that just kind of settle out. And so what happens is everything's gonna start settling out. The heavy seeds are gonna drop to the bottom of the water column and you'll notice that this will start separating out. You'll see the pulp uh, starts uh, rising up to the top, but there's, I can already see the beginning of the seeds beginning at the bottom. So I'm gonna let that settle for a moment, let everything kind of uh, go, go where it's meant to go based off of its uh, density and its buoyancy. Oh wow, Vivian, do you see the seeds at the bottom already? Oh yay. So you can actually see the clear water line working its way up because the pulp is floating up. So I'm gonna give it another couple seconds because I want everything to make sure there's a couple stubborn seeds that like to kind of get stuck, but as things separate out, they, they fall where they're supposed to fall. So I think that's pretty solid. You may lose a couple seeds in the process, but that's why you pick a bunch. So now, can everybody see this clear delineation? So actually, that's a prime time example. So most of the pulp and the fermented juices, things that we don't want going into our stratification mix, they're up here. So they're floating, they're easy to get rid of, and all the seeds are just hanging out at the bottom. So I'm very carefully gonna pour this off. I won't get all of it. 
But luckily we know the seeds are at the bottom and they're pretty stuck at the bottom. Cool, got most of it. Oh wow, it's mostly fresh seeds. That's why I like the, the cloud berries. Let's see. Okay. So you guys see, those are mostly seeds. I'm gonna pulse it one more time, just kinda, there's a couple stubborn bits of pulp, which we don't want that to encourage any mold growth in our stratification mix. And also, the nicking of the blender is also helping nick those seeds and help kinda uh, break the, the, the impermeable, like, outer layer of the seed coat. Because again, it's meant to pass through a bear, we have to simulate that through mechanical means if we're doing it indoors. Or if you're patient enough to go collect bear poop on the edge of a cloudberry bog, by, by all means. <laughs> Then you can just surprise berries in your yeah. I, <laughs> I did that up in Anchorage and I got all uh, currants and I was really excited. It was all black currants and red currants. And the next batch I did, it was all Devil's Club and choke cherries. So I mean, <laughs> so you get what you get, whatever the bears are eating, but mind you wear your proper PPE, but uh, with gloves, it's a kind of a neat little experiment because you have to figure it went through the scarification process. That's how all the seeds are distributed anyway. You plant them the, and then they go through their cold uh, requirement, they germinate in the spring. I got almost 100% germination of Devil's Club that way. So, And, and, to, and to add to that is, as far as cultural knowledge goes, um, my grandfather always taught me that one of the ways to look for your berries is to look in the bear poop. And so when we're driving along the road and we're near some kind of field, he would be like, hey, there's a bear poop, pull over. And we pull over and we're like, that's where the Nagoon berries are. <laughs> that's awesome. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, so now we see this is pretty clean. Like there's a little bit of, little bit of smudge in there. So I'm gonna pour that off. Just trying to get rid of any tidbits that could possibly spoil the mix. And now, since this basically, I'd probably do it one or more, or one or two more times just to nick the seed coats and also so, uh, make sure that I got all the pulp. But I kind of want to pass this around so everybody can kind of look at what the Uckpick seeds look like. Well, so, how about uh, actually, the seed thing? Um, I just did an example of a oh, stem smush because I know that we're running out of time. We won't be able to do all of them because we only have an hour. But I wanted you guys to see the different sizes of the seeds because they're very drastically different. They are. So I did just a level of examples. If you want to get, come up here and come take a look, just come on. Let me get these out of the way. Yeah. Okay. So. Let me do a batch of blueberries real quick. Berries. We've got nagoon berries. We've got strawberries. We've got gray currants. And then we've got black currants right here, and then a little bit more of the example of the oh, seeds. Oh, I passed that around, actually. <laughs> Where'd that one go? Uh, okay. okay. But you can see, so the, the octics that are going around now, the neck, they're very large seeds. And then you can see, man, these strawberry seeds are like, they look like dirts, you know? There's a lot of these seeds that are so small. Um, they're just kind of specks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was a really great year for the blueberries in June. Yeah, unfortunately, no. Frozen is fine, but cooked, no. Because unfortunately, that will overcome the vibe. So, but if you have frozen berries, by all means, that's what would happen in nature, so that would work as well. And just so everybody's tracking a blueberry batch right now, just so you can see the seeds. Oh, I have the, the cup passing around. Yeah, it's right over there. Yes, exactly. 
exactly. So you do have to do some bit of modification to be able to make those things grow. Um, but it's not hard because the things to modify it are literally right now are incredible. Okay. Okay. And so I'm trying to do blueberries right now to kind of explain yes. that process. Um, blueberries, so basically all the species we talked about Honestly, when it comes to the ras the uck pick, the salmon berries, the thimble berries, if you were to take old berries, mash them into a garden bed, keep it moist, the chances are if they, they'll germinate that spring or if they don't germinate that spring, leave it alone because maybe they didn't reach that requirement, that predetermined dormancy period, leave that for an additional year and they'll germinate. Because fun fact, at home, again, my toxic trade is not labeling anything. So in the fall, I took a garden bed and I took devil's club berries, western mountain ash berries, and oh, there was another one, highbush cranberries. And I took the berries and planted them whole in garden beds and forgot about them. Nothing happened that next year. I'm like, okay, well, that was a lost cause. So I planted stuff over it. And then that following year, there were rows of seedlings that were very, they were too deliberate to be chickweed. And I'm looking at these, I'm like, what, Josh, why do you never label this stuff? And so I had to wait again for the first true leaves to generate. I'm like, oh, those are highbush cranberries. Oh, those are devil's club. Oh, those are the Western mountain ash. So just because something doesn't germinate that first year, leave it alone. Because again, you have to figure in respect to like Alaska and the natural world around us, time is is relative. If they miss a year to germinate, they're waiting for their perfect conditions to germinate. If that one year isn't it, they can sit there dormant in the seed column. They can, some of them can see, sit dormant in the seed column for decades. So when these berries, when you plant them, a patience is the name of the game. If you take thimble berries and plant them, they don't germinate that first year, be patient. There's a very real possibility that they'll germinate that following year. I've come to find out with salmon berries. <laughs> so, and one of the tricks to get them to germinate when you're wanting to go out and, and pick them to germinate, wait as long as you can. The, the, the ones that have been growing the longest on the line that have been fermenting the longest are the ones that are going to seed the easiest and the best. Absolutely. And yeah. you also know the seeds are mature at that point as well. And I mean, when the berries start fermenting on the berry, you know that they're starting that initial process. So I'm, unfortunately, blueberries are a little more stubborn. So you have to do a lot more pours. But I already see the little, the little golden seeds. I'm just going to shake that up this time. <laughs> Depending on what the conditions are in the spring, you might have a patch that looks great one year and you get tons of berries, and the next year there will be none. Yep. Because the weather was wrong right when they needed to be at the beginning of the growing season. Yeah, and different berries are different based on that. And like one of the reasons that happens to blueberries is because the buds for the next year's blueberries start that year, which is also why it's really bad to use the rakes on some of them, because you're literally whipping off next year's berries. Uh, when you use them, so yeah. But they all grow different, a little bit different than each other, and then some of them are like uh, nagoon berries are rhizome growers, right? So, oh, that's actually really important yes. except for clones yes. and things like that. So when you are, so one of the things that happens, oh. One of the things that happens to me is I walk through trails to look for things before they happen, right? So I'm like, ooh, I see a bunch of nagoon berry leaves here. I'm gonna come back here later and pick. And I go there and there's no berries. And that's because that's the same darn nagoon berry as far as you can see. Um, it needs uh, some, it's, it needs not its own clone to be able to uh, continue germinating and making more. Um, you have to have not, not your cousin, you know? <laughs> anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm being recorded. Um, <laughs> uh, you, you need to be able to propagate with other berries. And, oh, sorry. Oh, no, I just want to add, actually, on that note as well, because we talk about the green berries. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so up in Anchorage, everybody has a nagoon berries growing in their garden, but not any. nobody gets berries because it's all one clone. It's all from the Alaska Botanical Garden, and you have to have uh, cross-pollination. Nobody gets berries. So come to find out, the nagoons germinate the same way with the uckpick, actually, in greater numbers. So if you want to get them to germinate, it's the scarification, warm stratification, cold stratification. But also something to add, uh, the, the uckpick, or the Rubus chamemerus, this species, it's not only needs cross-pollination, the plant is dioecious, meaning that they either produce male flowers or female flowers. So if you grow seedlings, you may find uckpick uh, uh, leaves everywhere, but it may never have berries. And you, you don't know until you look at the flowers whether it's because it's not getting cross, whether it's a male plant that doesn't produce bear, uh, like female flowers, or if it's a female plant that needs a pollinator. So with these, when you're growing uh, cloudberries, it's a matter of you have to plant numbers because there's a 50-50 shot that any seedling is going to produce either male fa 
flowers or female flowers, but you have to have both for berries. And it's only gonna be the female clone that produces berries. So that's why numbers, when you find those bogs of abundant berries or you find a, a glade of tundra that's just covered in berries, you know that there's multiple clones and mul multiple females and males all growing together that are pollinating each other. So that's something to be aware of too. If you plant one uh, seed uh, seedling in your garden, you're not gonna get berries. It's a matter of numbers and it's a 50-50 shot and you may have to wait seven years for it to bloom to know which one it is. But the hope is by us starting them indoors, we can kind of expedite that process a little bit. And, and, and I wanted to also, before I forget, uh, one of the things that you had mentioned about one year, um, those berries are really great, and then the next year they aren't. We're actually experiencing that more and more and more and more, and that's because climate change is a thing. It's real. And so uh, if all of us learn how to propagate these as we have more uh, weather changes over time, we will be able to make sure that these survive and adapt. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, I heard that there sometimes are mass um, years for crab apples. <clears throat> Is that so? I can't speak specifically to the berries, but there are going to. Oh, so she asked about a mast year. So we know that with like spruce trees, there's some years that just the whole crown of the spruce tree is just covered in cones. And it goes with a lot of nut bearing trees as well. And crab apples, there's every couple of years you end up with a year that's just a bumper yield. And so in the case of apples, a lot of times they'll produce a ton of apples and then they'll have almost nothing that following year. And it's because they expended too much of their energy that first year. So you end up with a, like those who actually grow commercial apples, it's called biennial bearing, where the tree will produce way too many apples one year. And it's like, wow, I need to take a chill year and relax and rebuild my energy reserves and then so it's nothing that following year and then the following year after that it's a bumper yield in the wild there's more variability or there's more variability there's more variables that go into that whether it's weather whether it's pests um the environment that they're growing in um i i can't speak to whether they have mass years but i know there's some years the berries are absolutely abundant and giant and beautiful and there's some years that they're pretty thin and i attribute that more to climate but i would imagine that that would have an impact so um I, what was I about to say? Um, so with those blueberries, did I, I didn't have the chance to mention, so that little cup I'm passing on, that's, are they, oh, right here. Did everybody have a chance to see these seeds? Okay, um, if anybody wants to, I will pass them on afterwards. So this is the, the black huckleberries here locally, or the science name is Vaccinium alaskans, I believe. So the Alaska blueberry as well. And so this species right here, if I wanted to germinate this, it doesn't need warm stratification like the rubus. It doesn't need intensive scarification like your uh, uck pick. I would just take these moist seeds, never let them dry, and I would take moist peat moss that you could just buy at Fred Meyers, the little bag that you buy in the orchid section. You mix it in with that moist peat moss, put it in a Ziploc bag, mark it, label it, it, don't be a Josh, uh, label what it is when you threw it in, and then what you do is you take those seeds and that bag of pea moss, put it in the crisper drawer of the fridge. Freezing doesn't hurt the plant, but it also doesn't help. It basically, it's suspended animation. It's not accomplishing its stratification requirements. It's just gonna sit there dormant until spring when it's then between 33 and 40 degrees and then uh, stratification starts. So chances are if the berry's frozen for a long period of time, it may or may not germinate that year, it may require an additional year. The blueberries, I think most of these can just be grown outside as is. The Blueberries are the, probably the one species I would suggest starting indoors under grow lights because they do take a long time. Uh, a berry that grows out uh, underneath a big uh, Sitka spruce out in moss, it has all the time in the world. It could take four to five years before it even starts producing deciduous leaves because fun fact, these are actually evergreen when they're little seedlings. And the whole idea of that is that basically the snow will collect on the leaves and bury it and protect the little seedling. And then it kind of goes through a plant puberty phase where just suddenly one branch produces giant deciduous leaves. But when you start these indoors, it was kind of fascinating to watch this. I start them in November under grow lights. They grow, they'll grow about two inches tall and then they go dormant, like they stop. They set a terminal bud and they stop growing. And you see the plant just sitting there. I'm like, okay, well, maybe the plant is done for the season. It takes about two weeks and then it's like, wait, it's still warm and winter isn't happening. And then the buds swell and it starts branching out again. It goes through the cycle. If you start early in November under grow lights, which is how I stay sane in the winter up in Anchorage um, with my grow lights, you'll go through almost four cycles of that where the plant will then, it'll set a terminal bud, stop growing, sit there for two weeks, and then the bud swell and starts growing again. So by the time maize rolls around, these little seedlings will be three to four inches tall. And the, the bog blueberries will be upwards of six to eight inches tall. So by starting those indoors, you're almost accomplishing what would be th anywhere between three and five years out in the wild, probably three years here in Sitka, because you guys have a long growing season. Up in Anchorage and Fairbanks, it'd probably be uh, five years worth of growth. But I know um, a gentleman up in Wasilla who did the same process, but grew them extensively outdoors. And my plants I accomplished in a single winter are the equivalent of his five-year-old plants started outdoors. 
So the blueberries are one that if you wanna try the blueberries, I would highly recommend starting them indoors. And literally, if you start them in November, you'll have plants that are large enough to put in the garden by May. You just have to then treat them like you would a cabbage plant where you gradually harden them off to outdoor conditions, put them in a shady place, gradually sunnier, uh, keep them well watered. But it's kind of cool too, because you plant them, give them enough water and a little bit of acid loving fertilizer, and literally you'll get another growth spurt during that growing season. So you will get almost the equivalent, anywhere between four and six years worth of growth in a single season. And for me, it's just a hobby that keeps me sane in the winter. So um, if you wanted to start with blueberries, the bog blueberries are the most vigorous and they're the easiest, but even these guys, you could have a four inch tall plant by spring. So I highly recommend, if you have the opportunity, you have spare blueberries in your freezer, I would give it a try because it's actually really satisfying and planting out those blueberries. I don't know how long it takes for them to produce berries, but it's, it's really satisfying. Turn it over to you. How long do we have? What, what time are we? I leave the girl lights on 24 <laughs> seven. Yes. Yeah. Bog blueberry. Yes. Can you say what that is? So um, the bog blueberry is vaccinating the luminosum. Um, it's the species that if you go up on the musk, oh, sorry. I'm loud, I'm sorry. Um, so if you go into any of the muskeg patches, actually I just went to a muskeg patch where I found the Rubus chamemerus, and there were bog blueberries. It's gonna be the dominant species you see in the muskeg. And then up north, it's gonna be the only one. And no, it's actually, it is a blueberry, but it only gets about this tall and it grows in the muskeg. Okay. Um, Vaccinium uliginosum. And, and for Sitkins, if you want to know where that is, it was near the storage unit up on Jarvis, um, where that field is right there. And um, I just heard we only have six minutes right now. And uh, directly after this, um, I am taking people for a walk towards Totem Park. And so I'd love it if you join me. Uh, they are doing a cross country meet there today. And. <laughs> That's a fair warning. We're actually gonna go to the beach. And so what we're gonna do there is we're gonna talk more about this and then we're gonna incorporate that with our vegetables and then also the immense amount of invasive species that are currently at Sika National Historic Park that we walked along and saw. And then we're gonna talk a little bit more about how you can incorporate this in order to fight back those invasive species and then of course which ones are edible because I'm a big fan of eating your invasive species and also just cook it all in bacon. Uh, anyway. Uh, and and uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about how you can manage those things and how it all goes together. And then we will both info dump about everything from nutrition content to uh, sustainable harvesting and growing of all those things. So we'd love it if you'd join us. Um, yeah. Oh, and part of what we're doing is expanding. So pretty soon, um, uh, the Hike Harvest Heal website will be up because I wholeheartedly believe that if we as community and people, we hike together, we harvest together, we heal together. And so the Hike Harvest Heal website will be set up and the Patreon will be starting this winter in which we are going to have many, many indigenous um, uh, educators gifting all of their knowledge about our traditional foods and medicines and how we sustainably harvest and that's going to happen all winter long so that in the spring we can directly apply that information and so some of that's going to come over zoom there'll be a private YouTube subscriber channel for people to get in because we don't have to talk to 8 billion people in the world it's for us and uh, and then uh, in order to reach children, and sorry, um, our, we were supposed to be presenting with the Kayani Commission here for Sitka, um, uh, but they had to cancel um, their sick right now, so they couldn't make it. And uh, But with the Kayani Commission, we're also helping to, and uh, University uh, Cooperative Extension Services, where we are developing, I am developing, sorry, um, VR experiences in order to be able to teach these things, which is why this was up here. Um, so when I'm talking about like, how do we reach people and how do we reach an insane amount of people and lots of people quickly, especially when we have a dwindling um, ferry system and things. And I know some of you will never put on this headset, but it's also like, how do we reach the next generation? How do we get them interested? If you tell kids, let's go grow some berries, sometimes they're just gonna wanna play video games instead. And we can do that while we teach them to do berries. So um, we've been, I've been building spaces in an app called Spatial so 
we have like kind of like a greenhouse template in there. I even put the blender in there for Josh uh, and, the, and the blueberries and things. There's even extra tufts in that room. Uh, anyway, but we're building uh, virtual reality spaces where we can just put on the Oculus. We can be in any village and we can meet with each other uh, easily in VR and then be able to do these classes. So um, there's lots of ways to learn, although no matter what, my preference is hands-on in the season, on the land, when it's happening, not in the middle of winter, in an abstract concept, in the middle of a classroom, talking about all of it on a PowerPoint presentation. So I hope you join me for us for the walk, and we get to do some more hands-on education. And yeah. And I did want to throw a nugget out there. Anybody who is wanting to try these blueberries and you want like, hey, you have you need some advice or like you're seeing something and you want to ask if it's correct uh, or like what, what you're expecting or what to see, um, Bear Mount, I, again, this isn't actually a promotion, but if you message me at Bear Mountain Forest Nursery on Facebook, I'll answer any of your questions and I try to make informational videos on this propagation because I'm doing it at home, might as well share it with everybody. Bear Mountain, Bear Mountain, Bear Mountain. Bear Mountain Forest yeah. Nursery. And then you can also find him under Frozen Plant Guy on everything. Uh, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, he is the Frozen Plant Guy. And then mine is just Yay, cute little raven, my clinket name. Yep. And Planet Alaska. Yes. Where is she? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, technically, it says in the book that we're meeting at Totem Park, but we're meeting right now. And then we're going to go gather outside. And then when enough people are here, we're going to go. And if you miss us, just keep going to Totem Park. And then we're going to be out and along the beach area, uh, right out front. Uh, good to see you. Yeah. Good job. Is there anything else you'd like to add? I don't think so. I think okay. that's it. All right. Good to see you. Go grow berries. <laughs>